Sophie is a long-haired chihuahua. She loves to follow her favorite person around, roll in her favorite person's hair, and sit on top of things. Stairs are not her favorite because honestly, navigating stairs is a bit of a bother when you're only seven inches tall. Dog breeds this small are often called teacup dogs because as puppies, they're so small, they can literally fit inside a teacup. Winston is an English Mastiff. He loves drinking water from sprinklers and at 220 pounds, he's so big, he can reach objects on top of the fridge. Strangers driving down the street will often stop to ask what breed he is, how much he weighs, or just to yell, that's a big dog. You might think a dog this big would be scary, but Winston is one of the sweetest and slobberiest dogs I've ever met. Sophie and Winston are incredibly different animals, and yet they're both dogs. They're members of the same species. Seeing different dog breeds side by side it makes you wonder what exactly is a species? Why do we say that Chihuahuas and English Mastiffs are the same species, but a Husky and a Wolf aren't? Why can some species hybridize, but others can't? And back to dogs, how did the various breeds become so drastically different from each other? I'm Science Mom. And I'm Math Dad. Today we're going to explore what a species is and we'll give you a glimpse of the amazing things we'll be learning in this biology class. Hello and welcome. A quick shout out to Anders in Minnesota, to Avika and Juliana watching in Kalamazoo, and Winston in Switzerland, Cooper from Ontario, I see Sage and Kai from Alberta, and Raya in California. We are so excited to explore this fascinating question of what makes a species. It really is a good question because when you consider the size of Winston and then how tiny another dog can be, like our dog Kaladin is not super tiny, but he's a pretty small guy. How can those be the same species? If I saw another human being that was way bigger than me, would I think that was the same species? Probably not. Let's take a look at a couple pictures and talk about how different the different breeds of dogs are. And then I want you to be thinking about how you would define a dog. What makes a dog a dog? So English Mastiffs, like the ones that we saw in our introduction, can be enormous. Hundreds of pounds, that's close to 100 kilograms, they're huge. And Chihuahuas, on the other hand, incredibly small. And if you look at the smallest and the largest that dogs can possibly be, the size difference is amazing. Here's the smallest and largest dog from a 1919 dog show. You can see that our St. Bernard. Bernard here is so big that, I mean, a kid could go for a ride on the St. Bernard just like you could ride a horse. But this little tiny dog almost can fit inside a pocket. Just teeny, so huge difference in size. But it's not only the size that is different between the different dog breeds. Take a look at the length of legs. And for this picture, Math Dad, I need you to remove us from the screen real quick so they can appreciate just how different these two dogs are. So Zeus, this dog right here, is the world record holder for the tallest dog ever. Looks like a horse. This dog is enormous. So big that standing on all fours, if you turn on the kitchen sink, Zeus can just drink water right from the faucet. And when Zeus stands on his hind legs, he's more than seven and a half feet tall is how tall he can reach. Oh. But this dachshund on the other hand, this little dog down here, if you look at the length of legs, Zeus's legs are almost as tall as his body is long. But for the dachshund, these legs are just teeny tiny compared to the length of the dog. But they're both still dogs. They're both still dogs. And now let's just consider the shape of the face. The pug has the flattest face of any dog. If you look at the side profile of a pug, it's like they don't even have a nose. Their face <laughs> is completely flat. The boar's eye, on the other hand, has a very long nose completely different shape to these two animals' faces, but they're both dogs. Yeah, well, I mean, what a snout. That's... So our first question in the notes, we're on page six and seven in our notes, is how do you define a dog? And I asked this before class in the chat and we had some great comments. Dogs are domesticated. And Rhea said a dog is a canine that accompanies humans. Um, Very Vance said that dogs are wet, 
They have wet nose, sorry, they have wet noses. They have four legs, claws, tails, and fur. Those are all characteristics that mm -hmm. dogs have. William said that they can bark and they have a sense of smell. And there were several excellent comment, comments about how they have wolves as an ancestor. They're related to wolves. So if you were to write down a definition, what would you write? And feel free to pause the video if you want just a little more time. Math Dad, how would you define a dog? Okay, I, I like it. Four-legged, has fur, um, long tongue, but uh, I don't know because some of the things that I would immediately think of, I wonder, are there exceptions to it? That when we see that the big dog versus the little dog, and it's kind of hard to say. And you mentioned a wolf. Would I just define a wolf to be a dog? No, I probably wouldn't. But what, what is the difference? Is it just that it got domesticated? So if we define a dog as being a mammal that has four legs, a tail, a wet nose, and an excellent sense of hearing and smell, and is man's best friend, because I saw that come up in the chat too, people's best friend, that's what a dog is, mm -hmm. our best friend, then does that definition also work for a cat? Because some Ooh. people would say that their cat is their best friend, not their dog. Well, so the way that we just defined a dog, it would also work for a cat. Okay, that means it's probably not a very good definition because I don't want to define a cat to be a dog. So we'd probably have to work a little harder to get a different definition. Let's think about some of the similarities between cats and dogs and some of the differences. So similarities first, they are very similar animals. They're both quadrupeds, meaning they walk on four legs. They both have fur. They're both kept as pets by humans. They're what we consider domesticated. And they can both be trained, they have tails, and they both have wild relatives. But we don't consider them to be the same species, and there are some really important differences. And I'm curious if you can list a couple differences right now before we reveal what we wrote. What do you think are some of the things that make these two types of animals different? Okay, so one obvious one, I think they might have been mentioned before, that the sound they make. They make different sounds. So cats meow or they purr, whereas dogs don't meow or purr. They'll bark or they'll growl. That's right. And the William family says diet. And their diets are different. Cats are obligate carnivores. That means they have to eat meat. They can't eat things like cereal or bread and, and be okay. They can't digest that. But dogs can digest carbohydrates. So dogs are more omnivorous. They have more variety of things that they can eat. I'm also seeing a shout out to JT videos for non-retractable claws. That's right, cats can pull their claws back inside their feet. Ooh. Dogs can't. So cats, cats' claws tend to be a lot sharper than dogs because they pull them back when they're not using them. Ooh, the litter box training. Cats are pretty good at that, whereas dogs are not so good at litter box training. That's a good difference as well. And also cats can climb trees. Dogs don't climb trees. And cats have 30 teeth. Dogs have 42 teeth. So if you were just to look at their teeth and how they can bite and chew, there's some pretty big differences there. And dogs can, dogs can taste sugar, but cats actually can't. They don't have the taste buds to tell when something is sweet. Oh man, so if we made up a definition for something that would be a dog, I mean, so the similarities wouldn't actually help us distinguish between dogs and cats. But so these differences might be important, but that would be a really long definition. It would be a long definition. I'm, I'm, I'm more confused than ever. How, how do we define a dog? So the way that we typically define a species is can these animals produce puppies or kittens? So uh -huh. will they have offspring? And if you take a dog and a cat together um, and have them breed, are they going to produce? No. Kid what would you even call that? <laughs> a cog. No, they can't crossbreed. You're not going to get offspring, but two cats can create kittens, two dogs can create puppies. This is the typical definition of a species, any group of individuals that can interbreed. And we are going to talk more about that when we get to our genetics, about why certain animals can breed and other animals can't. But it gets a little messy because we say that dogs, wolves, and coyotes are all different species. Right but they can interbreed. Oh. If a dog and a wolf breed, you get a wolf dog. 
If you have a cross between a coyote and a wolf, and this happens in the wild naturally, it's called a coy wolf. And coyotes and dogs can breed, producing either a dogote or a coy dog. <laughs> so if these animals can interbreed, why do we call them different species? I don't know, that totally contradicts the definition we just came up with. And it's not just dogs that we think about too, because you can get hybrids between different species that are even more distantly related. A donkey is a short animal with very long ears, and a horse is a taller animal with shorter ears. If they're bred together, you get a mule, which has long ears like the donkey, but a long face like the horse. But mules are not able to breed. Uh -huh. They are sterile. So knowing a little bit about that, that you can have different species that can cross breed, our second question for you is, could you cross a cheetah and a wolf to create a hybrid between a cheetah wolf? The world's fastest predator. <gasps> oh man. Uh, I mean, I have a theory here. No, I'm, I'm never mind. It's not just a theory. I'm positive. The answer is no. It can't be done. So, Math Dad thinks the answer is no. And what would you call it? Tina says I would call it a chief. Shadowmation says it would be called a teeth. And Cambria <laughs> says no. Dancing Slippers says no. I'm seeing a lot of no's in the chat that this would not be possible. But and why is it not possible? It is not possible because these animals are too different from each other, just like cats and dogs are too different from each other and you can't have hybrids. Part of it has to do with how many chromosomes they have, which we'll be learning more about in our genetics unit. You cannot cross a cat and a dog and you cannot cross a cheetah and a wolf because the number of chromosomes are different and the genetics themselves and how the DNA works is too different. It won't work. But if you could, you could call it a colf, a wolta, a chief. <laughs> it's fun to imagine what that type of animal might be like, but in real life, they're too different. And this brings us to a new way of thinking about species. So just because you can get a hybrid, does that mean that it's a different species? Well, so if you, with the wolf and the coyote being able to breed, they're still different species, so you could get the hybrid, so apparently that doesn't mean they're the same species. But what if I show you an example where they look a lot more similar? So here's a carrion crow. It's a crow that is all black that lives in parts of Europe. Okay. Here's the hooded crow, which also lives in Europe, but it has some white on its back and on its front. When they hybridize, when they breed, you get a hybrid that has patches of white feathers on the front, but not white on the back. It actually looks in between. So this is a question that scientists ask themselves a lot. Do we call all of these crows and we just have different varieties? The white variety, the all black variety, and the white on the front variety? Or do we call these two different species and say this is just kind of a weird thing that happens sometimes? Oh man. Do you have two species here, three species, or one? Well, that's a good question. I, I'm not an ornithologist, but uh, if they have different names, my guess is they were probably ruled as different species. The standard, the standard answer for this is that these are different species. So here's a better definition for a species. It's a group of individuals that naturally breed and produce fertile offspring. You want offspring that can also reproduce, you know, not mules where they can't reproduce. And for the hooded crow and the carrion crow, they actually live in different areas. The range for the hooded crow is here and the carrion crow usually lives here and they don't interbreed very often. You don't see that hybrid very frequently and when there is a hybrid, it usually, it's, its survival is lower, less likely than the other types. So that's why we say, okay, these two are different species. But it's not a question that always has an easy answer. No. Sometimes scientists will really get into debates about whether something is one species, two species, or more than two species. And this is why if you do something simple, like just Google how many species of frogs are there, you'll see different answers. These two numbers here came from websites where they actually listed all 7,000 plus species of frogs, but they listed different species because sometimes mm. scientists disagree. And there are new species being discovered all the time. 
So oftentimes you'll just see estimates like, well, there are over 5,000. <laughs> Wow. Wait, does this answer then the, the question about dogs and coyotes being different species? So technically, while they can interbreed, they're not likely to do it and just because they don't cross paths yes. naturally? Yes. So naturally, the coyote is a wild animal and the domestic dog is a, a domesticated animal. And in the natural populations, they're not going to be interbreeding a lot. It can happen, but it's not very likely and their, their lifestyles are different. And so because of that, because of their populations, their habitat, where they live, we call them different species, but they're very closely related species. Gotcha. The next question, going back to dogs, is to think about how much they've changed over the years based on what human beings want. The pug in 1927 actually had a nose. It still had a short, cute face with wrinkles on, in its face, but its nose was a lot longer than it is today. I thought that was a bear. That's a pug. That's a pug. A hundred <laughs> years later, the pug looks so different. And that's because human beings thought that the flat face with the wrinkles looked cute. And so when they were breeding dogs, they would keep saying, oh, the flatter the face, the better. But with purebred dogs, sometimes this can lead to health problems. The pugs tend to have trouble breathing and eye problems, and they're one of few dogs that actually aren't allowed to go on airplanes because of their breathing issues. Hmm. So some people are saying, hey, it's time to go back to this because if a face is too flat, it causes health issues. Okay, so, so the selective breeding that we did, we, we, we wanted to cross pugs that already had shorter noses, and then we crossed the ones that had the shortest noses again, and just over a hundred years. Over a hundred years, wow. we see a difference this big, and we're gonna talk more about selective breeding and things like that in this class. But I want you to take this example here and then think about a fun hypothetical question. Okay. What if people settled Mars, and there were two different Martian settlements, one where people had chihuahuas, but they wanted these chihuahuas to be the smallest, fastest chihuahuas possible because they used them to help hunt cockroaches that lived in these little tunnels. Okay. And what if the other colony had Great Danes or English Mastiffs, but they wanted them to be the biggest dogs possible because they used them to pull sleighs? Mm. A thousand years from now, would the chihuahuas, and here's, here's where it is in the notes, but a thousand years from now, would the chihuahuas look like mice? <laughs> or would the Great Danes look like bears? Would they be that big? Oh, man. There's not a right or a wrong answer to this. We just want you to take a minute to think about. So take a minute to think about how much different dog breeds have changed in just the last hundred years and then kind of extrapolate out in a thousand years, what type of changes do you think could happen? Well, that's an interesting question. I, I like this picture you drew here about the Shetland Sheepdog. So it looks like it's much bigger a hundred years later. This breed just about doubled in size in the last 100 years because people wanted a slightly bigger sheepdog. And we've seen this happen with many different breeds. And the answer to this question, to answer it more fully, in our evolution section, we'll talk a lot more about how new species come to be and if species can change and diverge and split into new ones. It's a fascinating topic that we'll be covering more in our evolution section. All right. And now we're going to get ready to do polls, but before we do polls, Math Dad has created a little mystery for you. All right, we call this the What's That Critter mystery. So this critter is an endangered species. So in the chat, by all means, type in your theory for the possible answers. So what critter is being described here? So there's our first clue. Maybe you have it. Maybe you need more clues. Oops. I can do this. Our next clue is that it has poor vision. It has poor vision and instead relies on its sense of smell. Ooh, so I'm seeing marmoset, white rhino, elephant, tiger, panda, white elephant. White crocodile. These are great guesses. Rhino. Ooh. Okay. And our third clue is this critter has a horn made of keratin, and the same substance that makes up our fingernails. Uh -huh. And now I'm seeing Rhino fill the chat. This is the answer to today's little mystery. It's a rhinoceros. Nicely done. Yeah, that, the horn clue was enough to 
to give, give it away. Well done, and now head to itempool.com slash sciencemom slash live. I know for several of you it might be new. This is the first time that you've done polls. Our first question is just a fun warm-up. And, and you'll, you'll want to type this into a browser, maybe in a separate tab, so you can open it up and participate in the poll questions. So our first one is just a fun question. Do you have a dog, a cat, both, or neither? When I was growing up, I did not have a cat or a dog. When Math Dad was growing up, he had a dog. That's right. And we have a dog here cheering you on. Go unbeatable science kids. <laughs> Yay. Kaladin's a good cheerleader. And you don't have to cheer too loudly, though, because there's no right or wrong answer, Kaladin. It's true. There is no right or wrong answer here. Yeah. I guess technically there is a right or wrong answer, but it's different for each of you. So I'm not going to know the difference from here. But which category do you think will come out? I'm, I'm really curious. Well, I do believe that just statistically, most people who have pets, I think, have a dog. But I don't think it leads by very much. I think dog owners and cat owners, I think there's a slight, slightly more dog owners, but... Well, maybe neither. Maybe. I'm not sure. Or maybe, maybe most of our viewers don't have pets. We're about to find out. Okay. And it turns out... Oh, oh math dad, you put cats for the right answer? Well, apparently I did not remove uh, the, the right <laughs> answer. But, um, option A, so dogs only. And then neither came in next, although just after that, cats. And a lot of people had both, so good mix of everything yes. here. Oh, that's kind of fun. All right, our, our first real question is, which of these statements is true? So we've got members of the same species must be approximately the same size, Members of the same species can breed with each other and produce offspring. Scientists always agree on whether animals are in the same species, and only animals have species. Which of these statements are true? What do you think, <laughs> Kaladin? I think he likes being held. He doesn't know what's going on, but he just knows we like to hold him in front of the bright lights. Wow, 54 votes for one category. Almost everyone is getting this one right, I think. Earlier, we, we had a good question about animals having fur, all dogs and cats having fur, because there are hairless dogs and hairless cats. Oh. But they are the exception to the rule. Most dogs and cats do have fur. Oh, super, super interesting. Okay, and the correct answer here is that members of the same species can breed with each other and produce offspring. That is the most common definition of species, but Sometimes scientists disagree about whether to call something a species or not. It's not, it's not always a clear-cut thing. Okay. If coyotes and domestic dogs can interbreed, why are they considered a different species? Is it because they have distinct genetic differences and exist in separate populations? Or they have different diets? They live in different geographical areas? Or because they can inter interbreed, they're actually the same species? Which answer here is the best? And it's just super interesting, if you ask me to recognize a dog, oh yeah, I can do that. But when you asked me today to define what a dog was, that was a lot harder. And these questions where the answers aren't so cut and dry are perhaps the most interesting because they make us think about these things in, in a deeper way. And yeah, I, I wish we could have some big conversations about this because I think this was a really challenging question to answer. It and, is. and it's going to drive a lot of the discussion that takes us throughout this entire course. Let's go ahead and reveal the answer. And option A is correct. That's the one that I agree with. Although it is also true that they have different diets and they tend to live in different geographical areas. Although most places where there are coyotes, there will also be people with dogs. Um, but then, um, back to our other question, when we were talking about whether scientists always agree about, agree about a species being a species, they definitely do not. Okay, so getting to our hypothetical situation on Mars, where we had the two different colonies. So if humans are on Mars, breeding dogs for two completely different purposes, how long do you estimate it would take before they became different species? Would it be a hundred years, a thousand years, 10,000 years? 100,000 years, 100 million years, or would they always be the same species? What do you think? This is a question that we're not going to answer fully until we get to our evolution unit, but I'm really curious just to get a feel for what the average opinion is. And even then, we're not going to answer it fully because this one's a hypothetical, but yeah, it's a super, super interesting idea. And 
How could they stop being the same species? Hmm. Math Dad, do we only have species with animals, or are there species for plants and bacteria as well? Yeah, there, there are definitely species for plants, bacteria, fungi, whole domains, all the domains of life have species. Definitely. And there, there are other classifications we'll, we'll talk about as well. Although, because the lines are not so cut and dry and because they're changing all the time, biologists don't make as big a deal about drawing the lines as I think they may have at one point in time. Okay, we have one category with the most votes, Science Mom. And F. They would always be the same species as well. Interesting. Huh. And then A was 100 years, and the second most common C was 10,000 years. We will talk about this more, but this is a really interesting question to consider. It depends on a lot of factors. The best answer is it depends on how long the life cycle is and what the pressures are. You know, do you have someone controlling the breeding, trying to get that face to be flatter or not? Well, what, what, what would you have answered? I would have answered um, 100,000 to a million years. Okay. So you think eventually they would grow to be so different that they wouldn't be able to interbreed anymore. But we'll talk more about exactly how that works and how long it takes in our evolution unit. All right. And our last question is just a, a fun one here. We have Kaladin, who did learn a new trick this week. And Which we'll show you in a minute. Yeah, but what trick should we teach him next? So to dance, to jump through a hoop, to how to hug, or to stay in place? And uh, Kaladin, we often just called him Science Puppy. Here we upgraded him to Science Dog because he'll turn two years old this spring. And dude, he's so cute and cuddly. I, I think calling him a puppy sounds appropriate, but I don't know. It's like calling a person a baby forever. Does a puppy <laughs> mean like baby dog? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Science Dog. He's ready to be Science Dog. <laughs> All grown up. We have several excellent questions that came in. I'm going to answer just a couple before we, we end. Three Amigos asks, what's different about a dog and a wolf? Dogs and wolves are actually so closely related that even analyzing their DNA, it's difficult to tell them apart. Coyotes are more different than dogs and wolves, and analyzing their DNA, you can tell them apart. But with wolves and dogs, a lot of it has to do just with their lifestyle and their reflexes and certain genes, especially how trusting they are and how easily they startle. A wolf is going to be much more um, easily startled and alert than the average dog and much less trusting. All right, let's reveal the answer on this. Okay, the most common vote here was dancing, oh, the ABCD, so then jumping through a hoop and hugging. All right, All right. I think, we'll Kaladin, do. you're going to have to learn how to do a dance now. <laughs> he, he can't wait. He can't wait. He loves training time. It's one of his favorite, absolute favorite things. Of course he loves it. That means he gets treats. So are you going to show him the oh. newest, newest trick he learned? High fives. And one more quick question. Ibrahim asked, why are mules sterile? This is something we'll learn all about in our genetics unit. We'll revisit it again. But basically the answer is because a horse and a donkey have a different number of chromosomes. Mm -hmm. And if you cross two animals or two plants that have different numbers of chromosomes, then the result is not going to be able to reproduce. And that happens with seedless watermelon as well. Mm -hmm. That's why the seedless watermelon don't have seeds. Now, to get to understand how new species form and how they can change, first, we're going to need to know more about how things reproduce. A dog will have a litter of puppies that are all unique and have different characteristics, but not everything reproduces that way. Certain bacteria, plants, and fungi can clone themselves, literally intentionally breaking off pieces and forming an army of organisms that are identical to them but there are disadvantages to living that way, which we'll learn all about in our next lesson, Life Finds a Way. So until then, work hard, grow smart, and we'll see you next time.